you're slaying with your Will Graham haircut, <laughs> your Will Graham era makeup. Yes, I, I am entering my Will Graham era because well, I love him. <laughs> which era of Will Graham? His post-prison makeover vibe. <laughs> you're entering your Will Graham slut era. Also, I am, I'm also in a full face of makeup and pajamas it's in the so... spirit of today's topic because it's what Elvira would want. It is <sighs> what she would want. Were you also um, have, did you also have full makeup when you were a baby? <laughs> no, unfortunately. Well, I mean... The topic's pretty obvious. Do you want to just hop right in? Yes. Hello and welcome to It's Giving Camp. I'm Saffron. And I'm Fabiola. And today we are talking about... Avira, Mistress of the Dark, the 1988 movie. Yay! This is a film that... Um, We've been using in a lot of our uh, social media images, huh? Yes, it's it's on the Twitter banner and it's on the Patreon banner. It's also my laptop's wallpaper. It is um, a film I'd never seen before today. And it's also finally one of the movies that I also talk about in my special study. Oh, cool. Okay. That's exciting. So um, I have a ton of notes and I might just read full paragraphs from my special study on this movie. <laughs> that's, that's fine. I mean, I, I really don't know much about Elvira um, besides the fact that you love her. <laughs> I had a lot of fun watching this. It feels, it's just fun. This feels like a fun film. I mean, obviously, a lot of the things that we watch are fun, to especially in the lens of camp, but... But, like, not all of them are straight-up comedy movies. Yeah, and this one is just... It's so 80s. It's so... I, I don't know. They don't... They don't make films the way they used to, a little. Just, like, just the fact that everything is practical, um, but then, well, not everything's practical. Most things are practical, but then the things that are CGI look so fake and are like so brightly techno colored and swirls of magic on screen and fake fire and all the characters feel like exaggerated performances. And I just, I had a good time. Do you want to summarize the plot briefly yes so it's basically about the titular elvira she kind of gets fired from her job as a b-movie commentator on tv and she also really wants to do a show in vegas but she doesn't really have the money for it and she also just got fired but also her great aunt just died and so she's like there might be a big inheritance there but what she does inherit is this old haunted mansion house and a recipe book which is actually a spell book and said haunted mansion -y house is in a small town in Massachusetts that's really conservative. And so and not only are the townspeople really antagonistic towards her, but also her uncle Vincent, who's very likely named after Vincent Price, because he really wants that recipe book because he knows that it's actually a spell book and he wants it for himself. Thus, conflict ensues while Elvira 
continues to be her glamorous, horny, dirty self and isn't all too phased by the town or her uncle and mostly just worries about making enough money for her Las Vegas show. <laughs> so I didn't have to come up with a source for this one because it's also the source I use for my special study because not only did I write about the movies but I also had supplementary sources for them. Mm -hmm. And this one is from, by Anton Battelle from The Little White Lies magazine. So I'm just going to read the entire par paragraph that I wrote. Um, okay. The short, the short article by Anton Battelle for the full magazine Little White Lies serves as both a review of and a somewhat academic introduction to Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, for its readers. Battelle praises Cassandra Peterson's Elvira as all snarky, smutty sex positivity and her ability to laugh at everything and everyone, including first and foremost herself. Camp, of course, is not a laughing at, but a laughing with. Battelle also highlights Elvira's position in pop culture in regards to the eras she embodies and the different pieces of pop culture that helped create her. The plot knowingly places its heroine into a backroads town that time forgot and into a scenario familiar from any number of older films and highlights the 1978 movie Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, which satir satirically resurrected the very dumbest trips of 50s B-movies a few years before Elvira's show was produced. Elvira and Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, seek to pass on their love for a bygone era of horror cinema onto the fictional teens of the film and the teens watching the movie itself, as the attack of the Killer Tomatoes screening is attended by the teens that, over the course of the film, have grown fond of Elvira. Elvira essentially is essentially the love child of mid-century horror and the starlets of 80s sex comedies. Yeah. I also wanted to like ask about the like historical context. That's not the correct phrase. What is the right what am I trying to say? Where did the character come from? <laughs> Where okay, Elvira the character. Um she, had she already she also had her actual B movie review show. Yes. Did that exist before the movie? Yes, that was the show that she had before and the show itself, I know this from memory, um, it was originally kind of a reboot of the vampire show, which is essentially a similar premise of commenting on old movies, but the vampire show was a bit more serious and more, it was just way more gothic in tone than Elvira is so what made Elvira so unique is not just the blend of 50s and 80s styles but also her sense of humor and the way she talks and communicates with the audience and also they were I think they were explicitly looking for comedic actresses and Cassandra Peterson who plays Elvira was uh, pretty sure she was a, a UCB comedian years oh. before so yeah <laughs> yeah her her sense of humor feels very um modern in some ways which I guess shouldn't be like too surprising surprising like it's not like the 80s were that long ago I think it, it feels so um distinct because she looks very like striking and in and, and gothic and kind of like a uh, timeless horror icon but then her sense of humor is so dry and witty and sexual and also the hair it's the wig is it looks kind of like the 50s beehives, but also the 80s mullets. Yeah. The, the hair is 
truly, like, truly iconic. That hair looks so big and so, um, I don't know. So, uh, part of me was like, I know this is a wig, but it she's never seen without it. Like, what is what is it like to 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 wear that? Like, it's really impressive. So for my special study, it wasn't just about picking movies, but I also categorized them within different types of camp. And this one is specifically under instant character. Mm -hmm. Because so much of the movie rides on the appeal of the character and essentially her character design. Like so much of what makes Elvira great is just the concept of it. Yeah. And then there's also her sense of humor. I mean, is there this concept of like watching a film and commentating on it? Like that's that's existed for a, a while. Like it was before YouTube, it was a, it was a kind of television show. But was she one of the first to like bring humor to it? Possibly. But it's also a really specific type of humor mm -hmm. because it's very both self-referential and self-deprecating. Yeah. A lot of the jokes that she makes in the film are uh, come from her being very self-aware about her image, I think, and her sexuality, her figure like was when she got like hit in the head with the like matinee, matinee E and or whatever like one of the letters on the marquee and what's his face whatever the the boring male lead is like how's bob. your head yeah bob uh and he, he's like how's your head and she's like well i've never heard complaints before the the direct quote it is well i haven't had any complaints yet oh yeah i, I know the that's... direct quote and there's another one she's talking to vincent and he basically said that he was shocked that she showed up to the will reading and she responds with most people are, are shocked by my appearance or something like that she's unapologetic though in her um alternative fashion i guess <laughs> like i mean what would you describe her style of fashion as like it's goth but it's also gothic it's like goth 50s and 80s valley girl yeah it's very slutty but in all black and also she has a belt with a dagger that's a fake dagger. And also the movie heavily implies that she's always had that makeup on. Yes. <laughs> like when they show her as a baby, she already has the iconic makeup look on. And when she does her like nightly routine, you see her like pop in front of the window and it's like covered in like a green like face mask except it still goes around her red lips and her like black makeup eyes oh my gosh Elvira I'm sorry are you all right yeah I think so how's your head I haven't had any complaints yet excuse me oh uh I think I'll live I also love that even though she wears all black and, and has this kind of like, that has that aesthetic, she still like loves the house when, when the teens like paint it like multi, you know, multiple bright colors. And she, when she, she, she does the, the makeover for the dog, it's as much pink as black. I just love the house. I love how its exterior is at least 10 colors, but on the inside, it it looks just like the haunted houses in old horror movies. Yeah, complete with uh, 
cobweb covered attic with a trunk with strange artifacts in it. I think my absolute favorite shot in the entire film is when she has the gun. Her Rambo outfit. I literally screamed. I literally like yet out let out a yelp of excitement because it's so it's just like the 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 layers, you know. <laughs> yeah, like you said, like referencing other films and also um her trying to like be badass and more almost kind of more masculine in this moment, but then also she's still wearing her same slutty outfit and then also it doesn't do anything against like it, it, she drops it like a second later because she's still up against magic but what does things is her heels when she throws one at vincent that does yes! do something that's what does damage to him and her um that and also the, the ring fact, yeah like this ring that looks like cheap costume jewelry is the super powerful artifact. Yeah. Sometimes the, you know, the magic was inside you all along can get a little cliche, but it feels, it's cool that you like- You believe it with her. Yeah, you believe it with her. And also you are like literally shown that she's always had this ring with her. Like it, it's, Maybe it's cliche, but it's also so exaggerated and self-aware of the cliche that it it's fun. The source um, supplementary material that I read, and it's basically talking about how so much of this movie is lifted from the older B movies that Elvira was known for watching, like the conservative small town and... Mm-hmm the evil warlock and the, the burning practical the the effects yeah and the practical effects monsters yeah i love the weird like monster thing that she summons in the casserole pot that also reminded me of the gremlins but maybe that's just because they dispose of it using the garbage disposal Well, I hope you're hungry, because here's dinner. I think I'm going to read from what I wrote about the movie itself, because I feel like it's going to bring up a lot of conversation. Like there's there's a lot that we can talk about based on what I wrote. Um, so Elvira as herself as the opening credits state is a joy to watch in this film where she has to live in a conservative small town to reconnect with her family's past in the hopes of securing enough money to stay in show in Las Vegas. Cassandra Peterson has created a classic character who looks like a 3D goth pinup cartoon and has a deeply real personality. Elvira knows that she is a cartoon as she enters and leaves a changing booth wearing the exact same outfit and even can't be so. A flashback sequence sees a baby Elvira in a full face of makeup and signature wig as if she, was bo- as if she were born in full costume. She gleefully shows off her breasts in every single scene, simultaneously indulging in making fun of the male gaze. Elvira is a goth valley girl, where two seemingly opposing aesthetics combine and create a woman who loves skulls and bubblegum and drinks machine soda while driving around in a 50s-inspired black car with with sleek chrome spider decorations. Although she is comically sexed up, or because of it, she inspires a teen girl in the town named Robin, who by the end of the film feels secure enough to wear makeup, hang out with boys, and watch schlocky B-movies. Yes, the teen boys in the town clearly want to sleep with Elvira, but who she resonates most with is a fellow girl. 
This is how Elvira affirms that even though straight men can and should enjoy her, who she really is for is those whose tastes and modes of enjoyment are rarely respected. Through Robin, the film and and Elvira affirm to women and queer people that it's okay and fun to want to be aroused glamorous goths with a penchant for the macabre and take active control over their sex lives. Elvira is a year-round celebration of Halloween and female sexuality. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's what I'll say. There is a lot of um, sexual misconduct in this film. There is, um, I was a little bit surprised, but then I was like, okay, it's an 80s film. Uh, there's there's going to be a lot of like weird gropey men but even though they're there I think it's it is nice that like Elvira consistently um rejects them and like I think that she even has a line where it's like just because you know like I dress like this doesn't mean like I always want it or something like that. I don't know. There was some line to the real estate guy. Um, And I think it's interesting to have that balance between um, the like (laughs) hoardy young boys in town who like want to take photos of her while undressing and she is like, okay, not the time for that but also can still like she wants it it, she wants to be looked at but she only wants to be looked at in the time when she wants to be looked at and I like that that is part of the message and I also like that um she it's not like she dresses the way she dresses and, and and has the style that she has just for other people she does it for herself like she she's still has agency over how she wants to be perceived in certain contexts yeah because in some scenes she she does want to be looked at and in some scenes it's she's like i'm just existing like this yeah and i think it's really sweet that she also wants the the teens in the town to have a good time like she partly kind of uses the the boys interest in her to get them to renovate her house but she also you know brings them lemonade and is like talking to robin yeah and and um like calls them her friend she's like you're my friends and like wants to like put on the the show at the movie theater the the screening of the attack of the tomatoes or whatever it's called Partly because she's like, oh, I want to make money, but also because she's like, there's no, you know, the town is so boring. She wants to bring life and excitement to it. Yeah. Also, I clearly love Robin and I love her relationship with Robin. She's basically the first kid to want to be friends with her in some way. And she's the first person to support her movie screening. And I love getting to see Robin's little like makeover when she goes to the movies with her high heels and her hair done. Robin? Is that you? As much as I love this film, I do, I did find the ending a little bit frustrating where like clearly the teens were always on Elvira's side, but then the fact that like after they stop this, like, uh, you know, the, the burning at the stake and stuff and she escapes, um, the fact that then like half the town comes back and it's like, actually, we love you. You've you've changed our lives. I'm like, where is this coming from? Like, I understand that the like the teens feeling that way, but I don't know. Uh, Patty like had such a sudden change of heart. I didn't 
really understand where that came from but i guess that's part of that's part of the plot like part of the, the structure of those kinds of films probably i also wish we gotten to see robin at the las vegas show at the very end yeah I, i'm just like robin is so validating as, as a girl fan of elvira <laughs> i mean in my brain, I'm like, I assumed that Elvira's were the, the girls and gays. Is, is that historically, her actual- Historically, she's been for the gays and straight men, at least in the 80s. But like, I feel like her female fan base is often really overlooked. But that doesn't seem to be overlooked in this film and yeah by Elvira yeah. herself if she was involved yeah. in the production yeah she she's one of the writers for the movie i love the fact that that even though this film is like having a lot of fun um it's not like it's a film about nothing like this is a film very much rejecting um like kind of the obsession with Christian morality and uh, like conservative ideals about like purity and morals. I mean, the literally like the council is like called it's the morality, the morality club. club. Yeah. Um, and I, I like that um, it just has such like disregard and, and, and mockery of that while also just taking so like having so much fun with being um with like rejecting those moral morals it's it's ha it's 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 like it's not even like it's not preachy at all because of course being preachy would be part of being like in line with these these christian morals it's it's just about like going okay they're silly let's ha make everyone in the town like make out and have be horny and watch movies like that's it that's it's just like let's just have some fun <laughs> though i guess she didn't even intend to make everyone horny that's just yeah when she messes was, up the spell <laughs> that was an accident and it was like oops the repressed people are repressed <laughs> But, but yeah, this this movie's very much one of the examples that even though camp is often political or has some form of politics embedded in some way in it, it is very much amoral. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's such a good way to differentiate it just because it's political doesn't mean it's moral because it's not i guess it because it, it doesn't feel like there's like this weight to it like yes it's significant but it's not something that needs to be taken seriously morals are about like serious you know it's your your, your serious values versus like what you believe in and your politics can be something that yes is important but doesn't um need to be the focus i guess yeah and also because camp is so invested in nuances and wanting the viewer to figure it out for themselves instead of just explaining things to the viewer that that same thing goes with morality because oftentimes movies that have some sort of moral or lesson in them will very much explain what it is that you're supposed to take from it mm -hmm. but camp is never going to explain itself to the viewer yeah I don't know I kind of needed to write something down in my notes because otherwise I, I'm like, this is not going to be much of a podcast episode if I just go, yeah, I had fun. Um, <laughs> so I kind of started to think, you know, a bit harder and being like, okay, wait, what is this? What does it feel like this film's saying or getting at? But it really, 
it really is a fun film it, it, it really just feels like it feels like a really good summer film i don't know we we were talking a bit about this uh you, you've been talking fabiola about this like the clash of um or the juxtaposition of like dark uh and like gothic and horror with like summer and bright colors um and this feels like elvira feels like a character that is really um fits into that canon well. <laughs> I feel a little odd. <laughs> Suddenly it's very warm. I put a spell on you. Remind you of anything? Remind you of anything? But yeah, I also feel like this is one of the cinematic texts that started making me go, hmm, Laura Mulvey's not all that she's cracked up to be. <laughs> oh, God, so true. Um, I mean, I feel like, do we just want to have a little tangent and aside about uh, our, the the fact that no one uses the term male gaze correctly anymore and also I, mean, I do feel like it's part of camp in a way the rejecting laura mulvey or not necessarily re rejecting laura mulvey but also how you can absolutely use the male gaze in different ways and even within the usual ways it is used yeah well, okay, so here's the thing. I think this is the thing that bugs me about the one of the th ways that people talk about the male gaze is that from also my it's relevant to this movie. <laughs> yeah, well, okay, so from my understanding, it's been like two years since I read the what is the text actually called? Because it's not called the male gaze, it's called it's called visual pleasure in narrative cinema, right. So one of the things that I understand about that text is that it's talking about like the literal camera, like the way like people are actually filmed in classic Hollywood. So the way you dress um, in fashion is not something that you can necessarily like e like you can apply any text to any situation but like that's not the context that the original text was talking about so dressing sexy doesn't mean that like people are going to be like or a camera is looking at you object like in an objectifying way even though in this film, Alvira dresses like with her tits basically out all of the time, the actual camera doesn't treat her like an object. It doesn't feel like the, the way she is filmed is a man like looking at her in the way that say the the guy in rear window looks through his telescope and is like looking at the different bodies. I don't know one of the main people that I remember Laura Mulvey talks about is Hitchcock films. So that's just like one just straight up criticism. Now then you have also like read and and written a lot about how being objectified isn't something that is even necessarily like bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's just a camera position and Mulvey's text is really reliant on Freudian psychology, which has basically been debunked for yeah. decades. So I'm like, why do people still reference this, this text? It's It basically relies on really outdated psychology and 
gender essentialism. Oh, totally. Because that's another thing. It's like a man looks at a woman in an objectifying way. It's like, okay, well, what about a woman looking at a woman, a man looking at a man, a woman looking at herself? Like, there are different sexual relationships that people can have. And that's camp. <laughs> yeah. Like to talk specifically more about like examples of sexualization in this film, in Elvira, I mentioned earlier that there's a lot of like examples of like sexual misconduct, but they aren't like, oh. Um, Those uh, uh, scenes specifically aren't filmed in an objectifying way, but other scenes are. Yeah. Like the man, you know, like the the start of the, the story and like part of the reason she is fired slash quits is because this like um the new studio head like is making like weird sexualized jokes about her and like wants to like take her out on a date and that's just like i'm pretty sure that's like a two shot they're like right next to each other and she immediately like throws him off of her and is like shouting in like frustration and rejecting him but there um, there are also other scenes in which there isn't any sexual misconduct but those are the scenes in which the camera does focus on her boobs or her ass or something well which which scenes are you specifically thinking of like the one where they're helping her decorate or remodel the house oh yeah and she's like lounging on like the porch like barely like doing anything her ass is just like up and out in the air but she wants that yeah this does from also me. near near the end where where she's running away and fighting against vincent she she's basically escapes through a a, a very classical looking cemetery by the one that she pops the gates open, open with her boobs. Yes. <laughs> yes, I loved that. Well, it's it. That's another thing that's so so camp. It's the exaggerated femininity in sexuality. Yeah. Elvira is essentially a drag queen, and she she's spoken about that before. She's been like, yeah, I do almost everything that drag queens do to get into this character. Question, are her tits real? They are, but I'm pretty sure she's also said that the costume does help push them up a bit. Yeah. But they technically are real. <laughs> Damn. I am looking respectfully. <laughs> I sent you the that uh Amazon find that was uh, salt and pepper shakers that were just her boobs. Uh, <laughs> Catherine and I were talking last night and they found that on Tumblr and was like, oh, I can't, this, this is, this is maybe, you know, like too much. And I was like, no, I love that. Like that's absolutely <laughs> in character for Elvira. I'm sure she would love the, that salt and pepper shaker. Yeah. She does have a lot of merch out and like half of the jokes in this movie are about her boobs, so. <laughs> Wait, okay, question. Speaking of Tumblr posts about Elvira, the reason that Catherine was, was looking on Tumblr was because apparently, is she gay or she's a bisexual? Yes. And has a girlfriend she, or something? Yeah, a few months ago um, when her memoir came out, she, she also wrote about and announced that she's been in a relationship with a woman for like 15 years or so. Oh my so. god! Like Wait, it's a long? long relationship. Oh, that's so sweet! Uh, I'll be right down. Let's do it! You know you make me wanna kick my heels up the show, throw my hands up the show, throw my hands up the show. Hey Elvira, we got us a couple more volunteers. Great! Just grab a tool and start banging. <laughs> I did want to 
talk a little about like all of the various uh, sets, like set pieces in this film. Um, and like the fact that um, Uncle Vincent has a secret room hidden behind his bookshelf. Very classic horror movie. <laughs> yeah. And um, like we mentioned the, the cemetery. I also love that they just like immediately go to she's a witch, she should be burned at the stake <laughs> in the town square. But it's true, there are like a bunch of really old laws that no one has bothered to change because they're that not in use anymore. <laughs> true. You know what? This film is actually a PSA. Uh, make sure your city laws are up to date so no witches can be burnt at the stake. <laughs> also, in this watch, I, I found the movie also really prescient in the sense that basically the panic surrounding Elvira really reminded me of the groomer panic that's happening. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's why I was kind of trying to like talk about like, yeah, this is a fun film, but it has these messages that, yeah, are really relevant. It really does feel like um, like the morality club very explicitly is worried that she's going to be a bad influence on the teens and they're worried that, oh, this, this will put sex ed in schools. Yeah. It's this panic about just any form of sexuality is seen as wrong and it's a Christian panic. It really, it really has, like, it has, what's her face, the, the, the Chastity hair. Pariah. Her Chastity. name is literally Chastity Pariah. God, what a name. Um, she, like, quotes the Bible and calls Elvira the whore of Babylon. The fact that this is an 80s film and it has such, um, I mean, this was the time of the satanic panic and we're arguably in it in another satanic panic. Yeah, like it, well, well, even though, but the thing is it's relevant again, but also I'm like, I don't know many films that are like this, that are coming out now that are criticizing this kind of uh, moral panic while also having fun and making lots of sex jokes. Yeah. Like, that's what, what I've been saying with camp is really hard to find nowadays because it isn't really being made a lot nowadays. And I think that's, you know, almost partly due to the fact that we don't have many mid-budget films anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And media um, literacy is at a low point. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not going to think too hard about that, otherwise I'm going to get <laughs> sad. Um, well, here's my hopeful thought. I do think it would be really interesting to see if there's examples of camp that are being made on the internet and that are being made um, by, like, uh, under conditions that are more free um from uh you know studios and corporations that might not have the same budget but um I'm, I'm really curious if that's something that exists they don't my really... mind immediately went to star kid <laughs> oh and that even and even that it's like they can only do so much with the with the budget that they have and also covid yeah well i partly i partly bring it up uh in that the hopes that if any listener um of ours can think of examples of camp modern current you know uh contemporary examples of camp that um come from uh new media or online media i'd love to hear them I, and 
I'd love to discuss them on the pod potentially as a bonus episode. I know our focus is film and television, but hey, the boundaries of mediums are meant to be broken. Do you have any more thoughts on the movie? Honestly, um, not really. I just had a good time. I, 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 I'm not fully, you know, I, I also think the thing about this film is that um, a lot of the camp elements in it are things that we've already discussed. The instinct character, the, the expression of um, uh, sexuality, the, the, the exaggerated femininity. Um, I think the, the main difference about this film is, is that it's our first like 80s and our first comedy, really. And our first movie that I've already had a lot of thoughts about. Yeah. And concisely written down. <laughs> Sometimes you don't need to have a super in-depth com- or super long conversation to to get deep. Sometimes you just need to watch it and then write a little. I do want to mention the kids roasting marshmallows on the fire at the stake. Oh my god, yes. Wait, that was really funny. It was the same Girl Scouts at the beginning, too, who were, like, selling cookies when Elvira comes into town. Okay, question. This is maybe our final little bit. Uh, Do you feel like you are more Robin or more Elvira? I would like to be Elvira, but I I am at the current state Robin. (laughs) You know what? I agree. But we can make it there together. We can both be the Elvira of our dreams or our nightmares. That's a great place to end this. <laughs> you can find us on Twitter at GivingCampPod and on Instagram at It's Giving Camp Pod. Our theme music that you are listening to right now is by Harrison Lurie. Shout out to our patrons, Nicole and Jose. I'm Saffron Heftigau. I'm on online at Gallup Hefta. And I'm Fabiola Liano. And you can find me on Twitter at Fabiola underscore Liano. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoy our podcast, please recommend it to your friends.